Last time out, I was talking about a video released by Harry Metcalf on his YouTube channel, Harry's Garage. In that video, Harry says that everyone should have hybrids, not EVs. Is that right? Does that work? Let's consider that today. The Harry's Garage YouTube video in question is called Why EV Uptake in UK is Stalling and the government must abandon its ZEV mandate. There were a couple of things in that video that I felt warranted a response. In case you haven't seen it, I'll link to his video from the end screen of this one, and I'll also put a link in the description. If you haven't already watched it, then you might consider doing so. As you might gather from his title, Harry's video actually covers a couple of separate but related subjects. In it, he talks about his belief that we should scrap the ZEV mandate and instead proposes that we all buy hybrids. On the surface, hybrids seem to make sense. There's none of that pesky public charging involved. Instead, we continue to use fuel stations to refill the tanks of our hybrids, which should be better because it's quicker to refuel than to recharge. Harry clearly believes that hybrids are the answer. That's what people want and should be sold, he says. Although there is an irony in that, but let me come back to that later. However, in a way, he also contradicts himself on this point a little bit. He quite rightly points out that EVs are a very small part of the total fleet on the road at the moment. This is because cars last a long time, so it takes many years for that fleet to change. Cars last about 16 years on average at the moment, and more in the extreme, so the turnover of the entire fleet is slow. Even if hybrids made up 100% of new car sales from 2035 onwards, it would be beyond 2050 before the fleet was replaced. Meanwhile, the science is saying we need to change before that. 2050 is the very latest date at which we can reach net zero, and achieve the legal obligations brought upon us by the Paris Climate Accord. We need to get on with decarbonisation faster than happens if we all have hybrids and burn fossil fuels. So we come to the other aspect of this. Hybrids don't decarbonise on their own. The final bit of the argument is that we need zero carbon fuels for this strategy to work. This is what needs to be the subject of our consideration. Hybrids are only relevant if we can fuel them using a zero carbon fuel. So our task today is to discuss how we're going to do that. Let's start the discussion with a little context. Let's set the stage, if you will. We need to be clear what it is we're trying to replace. Then, once we have that in our minds, we can talk about how we might do it. At the moment, we use 4 billion metric tonnes of crude oil per year and about 70% of that is refined into fuels, the majority of which are used for transportation. That's quite a big number, isn't it? Hmm. The good news is we might not need that much. The promise of hybrids is that they are more efficient. It turns out there is a problem with that too, but let's ignore that completely for today's video. Let's assume that we can make them 25% more efficient than existing ICE cars. That makes our goal to source the equivalent we'd get from about 2 billion tonnes of oil. 2 billion tonnes. And it needs to come in the form of a zero carbon fuel if hybrids are to be the solution to our problems. OK, so that sounds a bit challenging. But hey, we're up for a challenge, so we'll give it a good go. We have two options to consider, biofuels and e-fuels. Firstly, biofuels. These are made from organic material, basically plants. What Harry mentions is biofuel made from waste materials, stuff that's left over from other processes. That is indeed sustainable, probably, but there's a pretty obvious catch. If there's one thing that capitalism is known for, it's looking to maximise profits. Waste isn't a word people are very keen on, Quite a lot of the available waste is already used for something these days, including soil improvement and biogas generation, to name just two. That means we don't have enough waste material to generate the fuel for transportation, 
not even close. Biofuels from waste is a useful but very small source of fuel. So how about we grow crops specifically for biofuel production instead? Well, that's hugely problematic in a number of ways. Let's talk through just two, carbon neutrality and land availability. The first problem is carbon neutrality. It turns out that the CO2 neutrality of growing crops specifically for biofuel is highly questionable. That doesn't sound right, does it? But it's about land use. The land we would need already has something on it and removing that stuff releases CO2. Clearing new land for growing biofuel crops causes a big change to the CO2 uptake of that land. It's easy to think that this is a one-off problem, that we release the CO2 as we clear the land and then it's going on from there. But that's not how it works. The land we would need is already a carbon sink. What currently grows on it removes CO2 from the atmosphere. And when we convert it, it is less of a sink. It absorbs less CO2 when growing crops for biofuels than it did before we converted it for use in that production, permanently, for every year after the conversion. So after the land is converted for this new use of making biofuels, we've suddenly got a bigger carbon deficit to make up somehow. That's not solving the problem, it's making it worse. The second problem is the amount of land needed to grow enough crops. Because there's so much fuel needed, it would need a lot of land. Surely there's some unused land somewhere though, why would there be a problem? Well, let's put some numbers to the amount of fuel we need to get an understanding of the challenge. An organisation called the Energy Institute publishes the data we need, link in the description. Let's have a look at what their data tells us. In 2023, we created about 3.1 million barrels of oil equivalent biofuels per day. Sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Unfortunately, we also used 100.2 million barrels of crude oil. So we would need to replace those 100 million barrels with biofuels each day. In a biofuels future, we need 33 times as much as we currently manage to create. Assuming it's not magically going to get more efficient in land use, we should assume that means we need about 33 times as much land as we currently use for that purpose. That's probably not an insignificant amount of land. Is that possible? Let's look at some data on land availability. In 2022, the Food and Agriculture Organization released a paper in which they estimated the total global land area which is capable of supporting agriculture. They think that's 4.5 billion hectares. Of that, 1.8 billion hectares is unavailable, either because we live on it or use it or reserve it for other purposes. And 1.56 billion is currently used for crops. Of the 1.56 billion hectares, 5% is used for growing biofuels. That's less than 0.1 billion hectares. Doesn't sound much, does it? But to use biofuels to replace crude oil completely, we need 33 times this much, meaning we need 2.5 billion hectares for growing biofuels. If we do the maths, we see the problem. Adding the current land used, the unavailable land, and the extra we need for growing biofuels comes to a total of 5.9 billion hectares quite a lot more than the 4.5 billion hectares that is capable of sustaining crops. Whilst there is theoretically more land available on the earth, it isn't thought to be suitable for growing crops. So land availability is indeed a problem. Switching everyone over to hybrids run on biofuels fails in this fairly fundamental respect. Okay, maybe we're on the wrong track, but that's okay. We have a second option to consider. Let's have a look at e-fuels instead. E-fuels are created from the raw materials available to us by splitting water and air. That sounds more like it, doesn't it? We've got lots of air and we are regularly told that two thirds of the planet's surface is covered in water. This sounds more like it. It sounds more achievable. The sorts of fuels we need are made largely of hydrogen and carbon, 
So all we need do is gain access to those two building blocks, combine them together, and we're in business. We can get hydrogen by splitting water into its constituent elements, using electrolysis probably. We can do that, although it's only about 60 to 70% efficient. That's a bit of a shame. Then we need to gain access to carbon. Well, we're constantly being told that there's loads of carbon dioxide, let's use that. Except unfortunately, it's all in the atmosphere now. We let it float away for a hundred years or so, so we need to recapture it. We'll use a process called direct air capture. All we need to do is get it from the air and then split it up. Unfortunately, it's not all that concentrated in the atmosphere. Although there is too much of it, it's still only a very small proportion of the volume of the air. And it turns out it's very energy intensive to get it back. Very energy intensive. But it's possible. We do achieve it at the moment, or be at very small scale. That's because of the enormous amount of energy it takes. It's really expensive to generate that energy but it would be possible in the future with enough renewables. Now we've got our raw materials, we combine them together. Creating methanol is fairly easy, we'll do that. But we don't really want methanol, we want something with more complex molecules, longer chains like we have in petrol. That's doable, we have processes for that too. Although these processes do take some energy. Hmm, that's becoming a bit of a theme, isn't it? I wonder if that's an issue. Unfortunately, it turns out it is. The process for creating e-fuels is really problematic. Doing so needs an enormous amount of energy, as there are huge losses in the process. A combustion car driven on e-fuels uses about six times as much electrical energy as an EV. That energy has to be paid for, and so it seems likely to be six times as expensive at least six times as expensive, probably more, as the e-fuel needs to be transported to users by sea and road, whereas the electricity travels across wires to where it's needed with minimal staff costs. To put it in financial terms, in a report by the International Council on Clean Transport from 2021, they estimate the cost of e-fuels to exceed traditional fuels by three euros per litre about £2.50 more per litre. That would make fuel about £4 per litre in the UK, assuming that there is no extra VAT to be paid. Furthermore, scaling to do it would be incredibly difficult. We would need billions of tonnes of clean water, for example, from which to generate the hydrogen needed as an input to the process. They are currently trialling this process in Chile, near the sea, so there's lots of water there. Although you might have to expend some energy to reduce its salt content a bit before you could use it, so as not to corrode all of the equipment. However, if you watch Harry's video, that's not entirely what he was talking about. He says we can do it in remote places. There's nobody about in these places, he says, so wind and solar are just wasted there without e-fuel production. But when we say a place is remote, what makes a place remote is usually a lack of natural resources. If there are resources somewhere, then people would live there, and the place would not be remote. In reality, water is usually limited in areas where there are no people. So these huge empty spaces to create vast quantities of e-fuels are not as abundant as he makes out. Again, this is about the scale of the challenge, how much fuel there would need to be produced. There are trial plants which create some e-fuels at the moment, that famous one in Chile. But the plants are tiny in comparison to what we would need, mainly because it's so difficult and expensive to create the e-fuels. Unfortunately, our society is very cost-driven. We don't all have lots of money, so what is cheapest usually wins. Hydrogen fuel cell cars, for example, didn't succeed because the cars and the fuel were really expensive. E-fuels have a number of problems, including where we produce it, where we can generate power and have water without displacing people. But mainly it suffers from being too expensive. <laughs>
The cost comes from a pretty fundamental aspect, the amount of energy needed to produce the fuels. It sounds lovely, but it's not really viable. Not for us common folk, who don't have an array of supercars to have in the background of our videos. As if we didn't have enough problems already, there is one final little issue with both biofuels and e-fuels. One we haven't touched on yet, and that's a problem brought about by combustion. The burning of any fuel in air, rather than pure oxygen, produces byproducts, most notably oxides of nitrogen, which in themselves are not ideal. The first oxide we get from burning fuels is nitrogen dioxide, a harmful pollutant. This is an irritant and causes significant ill effects in people with respiratory diseases. So emission of that should really be stopped if we can. But the second oxide to consider is nitrous oxide. Unfortunately, that's a potent greenhouse gas in its own right. Indeed, it's 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide. An emission of that also has to stop for us to reach net zero. To be clear, not all of the nitrous oxide we are emitting comes from transportation. Not at all. But emission of all of it needs to stop, including that caused by burning fuels, whatever those fuels are. Biofuels and e-fuels probably do have a future, but it's to help decarbonise the difficult bits of the transport network, and the bits we will struggle to do any other way. Aviation, shipping, and possibly agriculture are quite difficult to electrify, so they are very much candidates for them, as well as classic cars and motorbikes. But not the easy stuff, not the vehicles we use for popping to the shops. When we think about ground transport, hybrids are a bit of a bust. They aren't a complete solution. At best, they would be a stepping stone, and one which we don't really have time for before that net zero target in 2050. Much as we might like to believe we need not change much and that we can continue with combustion cars, a clean future doesn't happen if we continue to burn fuels. Clean fuels are only clean in limited ways. Oh, and that little irony that I mentioned near the start, I think you might find this interesting. Harry wants everyone to adopt hybrids. He seems all for it, doesn't he? And yet, in a video released a little while before this latest one, he explained in a lot of detail why, when he recently replaced his car, a hybrid was no good for him, and instead he bought a diesel. Yeah, this person who bigs up hybrids in this recent video was quite critical of them only a month or two before, saying that they were too expensive and that the batteries in them were a problem. Oops. So, in summary, can we all just buy hybrids instead? Unfortunately not. We have to reach net zero by 2050. That's a legal obligation placed upon us by the Paris Climate Accord. Hybrids can't deliver that. At the moment, they run on fossil fuels, which would have to be replaced. And we can't create the sustainable fuels needed to run them at a cost the majority can afford. Biofuels aren't the answer because of land availability and sustainability issues, and the energy needed to generate e-fuels is enormous. That energy has to be paid for somehow, making them too expensive for mass use. Hybrids aren't even completely clean, as they continue to produce nitrogen oxides when they are burned, one of which is a potent greenhouse gas, and so continues to contribute to climate change. Thanks very much for joining me. Your questions and comments on this subject are most welcome. Where is this maths wrong? What is it we're going to do to make hybrids work? If you've liked the video, then it's a help to me if you click the thumbs up button. And it would also help me achieve my stretch goal for the channel if you would subscribe as well. Thanks.